David Ireland House's online publication, The Cabinet. And with that, I present to you Justin Nagel in our discussion on green or otherwise care, color, and ceilings. Thank you, Alex, for that lovely introduction. And thank you all for being here this evening. Um, so I'm going to jump right in. <clears throat> For David Ireland, color was happenstance and of great conceptual concern. He used color, but they were often those non-colors, black, white, brown, and gray, that came from the materials used, i.e. the gray of the dumbbell is the gray of the concrete. However, Ireland did not shy away from color. In earlier works, he used those more saturated reds and yellows, and later on, that unmistakable Eve Klein blue mixed with Fixol. Ireland used muted and subdued tones as a means of playing with and redirecting light, his favorite artistic medium. One of those subdued colors used, Battleship Gray, coats the exterior facade of his home and is so innocuous that passersby could miss the structure nestled on the corner of Cap and 20th Streets in the Mission District of San Francisco. In this way, Battleship Gray becomes an unassuming nod to Ireland's concerns regarding the hazy boundary between art and lived life. Institutional green is another color Ireland employed in all of its lackluster glory. Throughout his home at 500 Cap Street with stunning displays in the kitchen, the downstairs hallway and the upstairs hall. Institutionalist green is the color you have seen elsewhere, most likely on the walls of medical institutions used as a tool to ease after imaging of surgeons who have spent hours in the red guts of their patients. After imaging is a phenomenon that describes what happens when an individual stares at a color for an extended period and sees its complement when they look away. Hence, staring at the green wall of the surgical suite allows for quicker adjustment of the surgeon's eyes back into normal vision. Not only used for these purposes, it was also used in psychiatric facilities for the calming effects the screens purported to have. And it became so ever present and overused through misinterpretation and misuse of these practical applications that designers have moved away from institutional green, even conducting studies about colors best used within healthcare settings. But it begs the question, how often have you seen this color, whether in film, photo, or the very real space of the institution? Institutional green gnaws on sense memory through its familiar vagueness, like a word that lingers on the tip of your tongue, never fully spoken. Within the house, doors, frames, and chairs are enlivened with this color by paradoxically drawing on its drab pervasiveness. Green is the color most perceived by the human eye, often in vibrant natural hues. However, Dissimilar to uses in hospitals, institutional green as used by Ireland plays on the sensory reception and perception of color returned to us within a space or site specific work. The mundane ubiquity of institutional green calls attention to mechanisms of power inherent in the design and architecture of institutional space. Mechanisms that Ireland exploits in other projects using chairs or concrete or fiberglass effigies that implore the viewer to question how they locate themselves within the walls of the work. Saying color operates as a universal signifier or operative agent does a disservice to the power color has on individuals and their associations with it. Color has power, one we often fear because of deeply embedded significatory historical associations. For instance, in Western culture, the associations of black with evil and white with good, or in Eastern traditions, the association of red with marriage and happiness. The connection for Ireland to institutional green draws on the power architectural space holds over the individual. In Ireland's case, architecture had immense priority in his practice and daily life. Institutional green seen in this light represents David's attachment to and use of the color, employing these structures of belief built up around it. 
Unlike his Battleship Gray, which was a cheap mix of leftover colors, Institutional Green was particular. The color was present in the home before David acquired it, with remnants of older applications still present throughout. It captures the power of color as an institutional tool to transform a space and respond to the actors within it. When applied throughout the house, this green responds to the polyurethane coated walls and floors, refracting the drabness of its hue in a way that glows. It makes present concerns of how space allows for perceptions of power to shift. In this instance, it softens and creates warmth. A perfect example is the westward facing view of the upstairs hallway bathed in afternoon light. The yellow of the walls and golden floors sing in harmony with the solemn warmth of the doors, their frames, and the molding. It transports you to a place of curiosity, especially in the green of the untitled chair painting hung on the wall, or the chair with newspapers bolted to its back. These green chairs, attendant, an untitled chair with thing, ask us to linger and reflect on the power that an object holds when it holds the body. They perform through an action and absence. A body is not present, but calls our attention to that fact through a semiotic relationship to the object that signs and signifies chair. Think Kosuth, one and three chairs, or Magritte's treachery of images. They ask us, like many of the chairs present at 500 Cap Street, to question the use of the object in relation to the body and how these chairs perform as mediator for and within that experience. It exploits, as Comstein Lewis Ellen posits, the quote, dialectic of wayward subjectivity and impersonal rootedness, unquote, of Ireland's art that, encap that encapsulates his work and asks us to question the transient nature of both art and life. Not only present throughout the David Ireland House at 500 Cap Street, institutional gr green exists in other site-specific works that Ireland created throughout his life. One instance was in Washington DC at Jade Garden, which was an artist's apartment that he and Robert Will Height designed and produced in conjunction with the Washington Project for the Arts under the direction of Jock Reynolds. The unique feature of this location was not so much the institutional green covered walls, but the walls of corrugated metal, one of which was curved. Within Jade Garden, institutional green operates on a different frequency than the humming glow at 500 Cap Street. Corrugated metal and fluorescence draw out the blue within to produce a cool ambiance and aura quite different from that of the house. It reflects the refracted light of the metal imbuing a blue hue, creating it, making it cave-like and inviting in a way recalling rest or slumber and fitting for a home. The institutional monochrome that is the wall requires stillness and asks us to spend time getting lost in it. Inversely, however, it is so mundane that this institutional green wall as a painting could easily get looked over and hum in the background of, mon of the monotony of day-to-day -day existence. The color does not overpower and creates stillness, perhaps in the same way that a color like drunk tank pink has on the over intoxicated. This use of color reveals the poetics within Ireland's work that require us to sit with the minimal use of a material to its maximum effects and asks for pause to draw out its meaning and form. This notion of pause that Ireland exploits has led me to think about the ceilings within his home and how they operate as moments to, of rest to reflect on one's position underneath. On a recent trip to the David Ireland house, I st stared at the ceiling in his bedroom as I laid there on my back. I stared for what seemed like an eternity, a dreamy drifting into the sea of ochre interspersed with a drab green hue contemplating the space of and below and my position within. In actuality, I was only on this varnished floor for roughly 10 minutes, but in that time, I lost myself in the stutters and scrapes of color mixed with the cracks that bear witness to the house's history, forever preserved under a diaphanous shield of polyurethane. 
Lying on his floor, staring at the abstraction above was a privilege as guests to the house today are not often afforded the same freedom of experience. It gave me pause to contemplate the space of the ceiling, one that protects, inhibits, and conceals deeper meaning behind plaster and paint. These ceilings are about care and protection, much like Ireland's cabinets, and give us moments in a cacophonous world for stillness, even if it is only to lie on our back and wonder about the green and ochre landscape painted above. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Justin, for reading um, that short excerpt uh, that is available on our cabinet, uh, 500capstreet.org slash the cabinet. Um, we will now kind of go into our short facilitated discussion and then eventually our Q&A. Uh, the first question for Justin that I have is a little bit of a two-parter. Uh, the first one is, where was institutional green first found within our world? And what does this color mean psychologically? Does it have this same effect as drug take pink has on, um, I guess, us humans? Mm -hmm. So the color institutional green, we first kind of see it um, make its appearance in institutions in the early 20th century. Primarily uh, physicians uh, shifted in like around 1915 to wear scrubs that were what they call a spinach green. So it's a little bit darker than the institutional green um, that you see in the house. Uh, but as far as being put on walls, it happened around the 1930s when they started to use it uh, within institutional spaces, primarily psychiatric institutions, because it's said to have this kind of soothing calm effect. Um, because of the like warmth of the color and the kind of um, ubiquity of the color as well, right? Because, you know, green is that color we see most in the world. Wow, thank you. Yeah, I feel like it's a very natural, naturalist kind of base color. Um, as well as, I don't know, when I stare at it a little bit too long, I definitely tone it down a couple of times. <laughs> um, the next one is, you know, we know that this is used for after imaging, but how does it really truthfully affect the, the brain? And when did David Ireland first use this color in his works? Um, besides, you know, 500 Cap Street and Jade Garden, where else is it within um, his practice? So uh, with the color, it kind of, it's a soothing color. It's, right, it's a warm color. Uh, the wavelengths are a little bit shorter. Uh, so it kind of, you can lose yourself in it, right? It kind of eases you out of it. It's not jarring. It's a, it's a smooth transition, right? And I think that's why it was primarily used, um, right, in institutions. And then that kind of after imaging for post-World War II in the surgery suites. Um, and I think the first use of this color for David was here. He found it here in the house, right? And then kind of exploited it there. Um, but it's not just in, you'll see it other places like the Headlands, um, Jade Garden that was mentioned. He also had a um, commission that he did for an office that was actually two rectilinear sculptural pieces that were this institutional green color uh, that are really interesting as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're the ones in the LA law office. Um, yeah just recently found out within the past couple of years. Whoa. Next one is, you know, we're talking a lot about this color green and, and how colors are, um, what they really mean to us in this kind of Western uh, perspective. So maybe let's dive into what are the differences between cultural associations of color? Um, you know, when I first encountered David Ireland's works and, you know, David Ireland's colors, uh, I noticed mm -hmm and kind of projected my own, um, I guess, feelings and thoughts, uh, you know, being a printmaker, I noticed that he's using a lot of uh, process colors, we like to call them the CMYK colors, you know, the processed yellow, the processed red, the processed blue, um, even the ochre walls that you can see, you know, right behind Justin reminded me so much of the yellow color that you get when you make intaglio prints or etchings. 
Um, so how are these color associations translating in other states and places? And maybe let's dive a little bit deeper into this Western versus Eastern color associations and this uh, fear also of certain colors. Yeah. Well, the thing with color is it's contingent, right, on the viewer. So we all bring something, I think, different to color, right, and kind of the meaning that's attached to it. However, like cultural connotations kind of or cultural, um, you know, the culture kind of creates the meaning behind the color in a way, right? Because I can't help but think of like the idea of like good and evil as represented by black and white and kind of how that's a very kind of um, Western perspective, right? Whereas like or even like the white of the wedding here in the Western, in our Western culture is something that is interesting to me when you consider other cultures where white is uh, a morning color, right? A funereal color. Um, yeah, and I think for me, David's uh, use of color, I think that you make a very deft point in bringing in uh, screen print or printmaking because, you know, David was a printmaker before he shifted into the kind of sculptural architectural marvels that he did and I think that's an interest because I see it too right not so much as a printmaker but it's just a very keen observation and um for me though too with David colors the color he used was the color he found right like the color of the material was the thing and when he used his color right it's very specific like there's a piece that he has that's about his time in Spain that is the colors of the Spanish flag it's a bright red, a bright yellow, and a bright white. So I think for David too, the like idea of color, it also plays on those semiotic understandings of kind of subjectivity and art as well. Wow, nice, thank you. Um, I guess this next kind of question I have is, uh, what is, you know, we're talking about green really and he has these other colors that he uses um what is like this what's like the second most used color besides you know the stereotypical ochre and the green that's david's using and maybe do you think that these colors are somewhat autobiographical within his life you know it's it's later in his life he begins to use that famous um yves klein blue mm -hmm. and a lot of works featuring this yves klein blue making um these uh god they're like little interesting little sculptors. I'm actually staring at one right now. We got mm -hmm. it over the desk. Um, but yeah, are they autobiographical or what's this second color that um, is? Well, when I think of David, aside from the yellow, the color that most I most think of is the gray, right? The battleship gray that you see on the outside of the house, the battleship gray of the dumbbells, the kind of, um, you know, the uh, one of my favorites, the angel go round, that's primarily gray with like a pop of yellow. Um, so I, and I think the idea of the battleship gray, right? Uh, David was in the Navy. So like that kind of comes from that as well. And he also spent a lot of time in Hunter's Point, right? And kind of seeing that kind of the surroundings, right? Informing the, the color choice, but also that kind of like, again, tying it in slyly right to himself in a kind of very like warholian way right like the soup can so i do think the colors are purposeful right because we know that the walls weren't actually yellow right it's a tinted urethane yeah he would say that they were yellow but uh no that's just one of david's many um tall stories uh actually exactly like the ones that hide me here so um I guess kind of going into that before we get to some amazing uh, group questions uh, that I can already see in our chat box filling up. Um, what is your interpretation of institutional green and these color associations in the house? You know, again, we were just talking about very purposeful uses. It's not just random. Um, he chooses what he wants to show, what he wants to highlight, what he wants to keep hidden all throughout his works and throughout the house. Uh, why do you think he kept this like color green, you know, like perp like in his house besides just, oh, I like this color. Yeah, 
So I think for me, um, the connection to David and this color, it's kind of, it's that intelligence that David brings to the work, right? In terms of like using the semiotic connection, right? Of a color, of a material, of a space, of an object to kind of draw on the body of the viewer. So I think for me that like, and like you have to remember too, this house, he purchased the house in 75. So this institutional green, you would still be seeing it, I think in institutions all over the place, right? Especially health institutions. And if you notice, um, the institutional green is primarily on like doors, molding and chairs, right? Which are kind of about the institution as a structure, right? So it kind of, again, is I think talking, for me, I see it as a connection to like, almost like a critique of kind of like this color, but also kind of a reverence for it and kind of tying it to the space of the institution, right? And really kind of connecting it there, right? Cause like a door, right? It, it's about space and the institution and what's on the other side of the space, right? Whereas the door behind me, you can't, it's, yeah. it's basically become a monochrome at this point to the kind of um, speaking to the concern of its use within hospitals and healthcare as well. That's interesting. I don't know. Again, when you think of institutional spaces, you always enter them or I don't know, they're always objects that are found within there. They're always colored green or it's never mm -hmm. like a, you find a green blanket in the um, hospital, you find a green wall. Yeah. Um, or, I mean, you see the green on the subway, the uh, street level subway platforms here too, right? All of that metal on those raised platforms is green. Right, some of darker green, some this institutional green. So, yeah, yeah. amazing. Um, I'd love to take a couple questions from the audience now. Uh, if you guys have any other questions that you'd like to ask right now, you know, leave a quick little comment below, and we'll make sure to get to them. Uh, the first one comes from our very own Kate Malloy. Were you interested in this color, institutional green, before working at the David Ireland? Were you ever interested uh, in green? <laughs> no, I actually, before I started working here, I hated green. I still kind of, I shy away from it in my practice um, because I just, I don't know that for me, it adds anything to what I'm trying to say, but I really kind of have a newer appreciation for the color green, I think upon reading uh, and doing the research for this, like I've been reading uh recently read through Derek Jarman's Chroma and he spends quite a bit of time talking about green and it's kind of you know female significance like nature significance and kind of like the potential that green has and I think that's important to to remember for the color green right because it's like of the earth it, it's about new life and I think that's it's kind of expanded my view on the color green. Amazing. Um, we have another little two-parter uh, from Kristen. Uh, the first one is basically, do you think David Ireland used this color in his house to suit himself or was it just more of a happenstance to find it there? I, that's hard to say. I feel like because of where it is within the house and the spaces, I think it's more about he found this color and wanted to let it sing for what it was. Um, but I do in the bedroom though, there is that ceiling that is that kind of green, right? Where he slept after a certain point. So it could very well be a combination of the two, but I'm pretty sure it's kind of the finding it and then letting it do the work, right? Cause that's what David was about. Yeah. Um, and then also, I guess, following up to that question, uh, it is about the bedroom, it's kind of funny enough. Do you think David knew about Goheath's color theory in which green was thought to be a soothing color, thus a great color for bedrooms? Oh, kind of funny. I mean, it's possible. I mean, David was well read. And I don't know that I've seen any Goethe's, uh, of Goethe's work um, on his bookshelves, but I think it's safe to say because David was so invested in history and art history and kind of like 
paying homage to these like legacies, right? And these lineages that he was a part of, it's very possible. Oh, you're muted, Alex. Oh, sorry about that all. Um, the next question that we have comes from our very own Laura Piccini, our fellow artist guide. Yay, Laura. Um, green is a more expensive pig, or is green a more expensive pigment color uh, versus, such as, you know, the uh, polyurethane color, which you could buy back then in gigantic vats and Battleship Gray you could buy in gigantic vats. So I guess, did he specifically use this color green um, as like a accent or because, you know, he couldn't readily get large amounts of the color green. Is that why he used it, you know, so sparingly? And did he distinguish it maybe differently? And that's why it's only in certain parts of the house. Well, I think, um... I'm assuming that paint is probably more expensive, but the gray and the amber, like you're saying, right, comes in large batches. And I just feel like those colors are more important to David, uh, just in terms of the overall effect that they have for his practice. And that like, I feel like the green, the institutional green is a special color, right? Like, so it's, it's only reserved for these, you know, doors, the molding, the kind of the chairs and things found around the house. Um, and I would assume he did because it's, you know, it's not that gray, the gray, everything was gray. Most of, well, not everything, but a lot of it was gray, right? Just even the dumbbells are gray. So I think, yeah, color was important, but it wasn't, you know, the driving force. Uh, um, the next one comes from Julian. Uh, I'm curious about the boundary between the domestic and the institutional. Even the house has moved from a living space to an institutional slash shared slash gallery space. Can you speak more to your contemplation of the ceiling? Was that a domestic moment or protective? For me, I was thinking more as protective, right? Because when I came into the house to like lay on the floor, like to just come into the house, it was during quarantine where we weren't really giving tours and we were allowed to like visit once or, you know, once every two weeks to kind of just like stay with the space, continue to allow the space to inform us. So for me, it was definitely like this notion of protection and kind of like allowing myself to get lost in this, ceiling above me, right? Like it, as it's protecting me, right? And then kind of furthering that protection through um, the, you know, the, the, the like meditative quality that it had, you know? Cause as I said, I laid there, it seemed, it felt like a lot longer than it was. And yeah, I'm really interested in the ceiling as this kind of protective structure, but also it, it inhibits, right? Cause it, it's a cap on space, right? It's, it also, you know, stops people from upward mobility, right? In, a, in certain metaphors and, but it also protects. So it's this weird, uh, yeah, it's that like one of those weird kind of unsettling things when you actually spend some time with it for yeah. me. And it's a privilege to also have a ceiling. Um, yes, especially in the Bay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe could you speak a little bit more on that of this privilege of, of having a ceiling and well for me this idea of privilege right like it's a that's a privilege uh i mean because of capitalism to like live in a house or an apartment or have like a roof over your head and i was just really thinking about this idea of like what is protection and how is protection kind of this privileged thing that happens and so it like led me to the ceiling but I was thinking about all of these things just because of kind of where we are uh, geographically right in a in the Bay Area that's kind of got this obscene no amount of like urban development a lot of which is halted because of things and kind of like so what does it mean I again thinking about what does it mean to have these spaces right 
and then not have access to that space too, right? But also a ceiling does this thing where it also conceals, right? So I was also thinking about that a lot too, right? Like these ceilings that you see around you in like the neighborhood and the city, right? They conceal a lot of things too, right? They can in a way conceal that privilege um, just because like through like the metaphor. Wow, thank you. Um, it seems that we have gotten through all the questions in our little chat box, but I just kind of want to bring up one final one that we got from Instagram, uh, which might be relevant to some of you guys, uh, which is, will this performance lecture be recorded and distributed? Um, I missed out on registering and would love to watch later. Uh, yes, it will be available on our YouTube channel, um, as well as again, gonna link our 500capstreet.org slash the cabinet, uh, where you can read Justin's article in completion, um, as well as read many of our other artist guides, uh, writings, thoughts, ponderings, whatever else. Um, and I guess basically with that, we are now going to take a breath and move on to the, oh, I just actually got one. Uh, let's answer this one really quickly before we move on to our lovely meditation and take a moment to uh, give a little bit of pause. But before that, what questions are you still pursuing in this research, Justin? Uh, Jacqueline asks. Well, I'm still pursuing the ceiling, I think a little bit further because I've started work on that and kind of it's, it's very tentative. So I'm thinking of like expanding that further and really kind of exploiting this notion of like the duality of like protection and care with like kind of like in inhibition and concealment to kind of fully kind of flush out how we can understand this metaphor of the ceiling. Um, and I think also another question that I'm contemplating or that has kind of come up too is kind of these other colors that David uses and the kind of signification of them throughout his like oeuvre of work as well and kind of how something like the gray kind of it's so uh ubiquitous in the work that like you know how do we kind of understand that more right especially when we think about like the metaphor or like the kind of the gray area right and kind of this and thinking through david and this kind of relation of like losing oneself in the work as it were. Wow, thank you. Amazing, awesome, great questions. Love these questions. Um, yeah, so now we are gonna take a moment and Justin is going to take over and we will be doing a guided meditation on the ceiling. So I'm gonna hand it off to you. I just ask that you find a comfortable position, allow yourself to sit straight up with your palms flat on the surface. Take a slow, deep inhale and a complete exhale. Taking three deep breaths, Focus on the image of the ceiling in front of you. As you begin awareness of your breath and the ceiling in conjunction, start to notice what thoughts are going through your mind. What are you thinking about? Do not get caught up in these thoughts. Just begin to notice them as they travel across your mind.
Let them go as they pass. Watch them come and go. Continue breathing deeply and focus on the ceiling in front of you. Gently guide your focus to the cracks and the sensation of breath rising and falling. Fall into the cracks. Where do these cracks take you? Allow your mind to jump. It is free to travel, jumping from place to place. Do not become attached to any one setting or image. Continue to observe the cracks and fall in and out of them with your breath. Notice where the mind wanders. Release that thought. Let it fall into a crack in the ceiling as you focus on your breathing. Letting go of expectations and judgments. As your mind wanders away from this image, gently guide your attention back through your breath. Again, three deep breaths. Now, one slow, deep inhale. Now, long, complete exhale. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Justin. We feel 10 times calmer now. <laughs> um, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and I would also like to bring attention to our next program, which is Wednesday, February 24th at 5 p.m., Making and Maintaining Space with Sam Claude Carmel. Carmel highlights David Ireland's con concept of maintenance action and draws parallels to the labor of San Francisco's past conceptual art spaces the Langdon Arts, 1975 to 2009, and the Museum of Conceptual Art, 
from 1970 to 1984 that served as the blueprints to the next generation of community art spaces in the city. Carmel will also examine the community building that they, they have made the past couple months successfully and expand on the new strategies for the longevity and adaptability of San Francisco's emerging art spaces. I would also like to once again remind you guys that you can subscribe to this one as well as all of our other programs that will be happening from February 24th to March 10th on 500capstreet.org slash programs. And if you guys feel oh so fancy and wanna throw us a couple bucks, 500capstreet.org slash donate. And with that, thank you all for coming. It's lovely to see all your faces and I hope you have a great day. Bye.